Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at apical dominance, the role of plant hormones in leaves, gibberellins and stem elongation, gibberellins and seed germination, and then we'll finish with a summary. So plant hormones play an important role in a process called apical dominance. So we previously saw in the last videos that a, a bunch of molecules known as auxins are a type of plant growth factor, and these control the processes of phototropism and geotropism in plant shoots and roots. So remember, phototropism is where we have a plant growing towards sunlight or a source of light, and geotropism is where plants grow towards gravity. So we saw how auxins control both of these processes. But auxin has other roles as well. It plays a role in inhibiting the growth of side branches from the lateral buds coming off of the stem, and these are present further down the shoot. So when you look at several types of plant, we can see these lateral buds going down the stem of the plant. And these lateral buds are aiming to grow outwards and extend the plant in different directions. However, when these auxins are present, they inhibit the growth of these lateral buds, and so the further down the shoot there is less growth happening. And we call this type of inhibition of the lateral buds apical dominance. So it's called this because the apex of the plant is more dominant in its growth, whereas the lateral buds aren't growing so much. It's thought that apical dominance occurs because high auxin levels cause there to be high levels of the hormone abscisic acid in the shoot. So the auxin itself isn't causing the apical dominance, but it's causing the action of another molecule to kick in. So first of all, the auxins are released, and once the auxins have been released, they cause the release of a second molecule, which is the abscisic acid. So the abscisic acid is the sort of second step in this process. The role of abscisic acid is to inhibit the growth of buds, and then this contributes to the apical dominance. So the abscisic acid is a hormone, and this will work on the lateral buds to stop them from growing into elongated stems. And this means that only the apex of the plant will grow, and this is how we get apical dominance. It's also thought that apical dominance occurs because high levels of auxins help to keep the levels of another molecule known as cytokinins in the shoot low. So auxins have two roles, therefore. They not only cause the release of the abscisic acid, as we said before, but they also seem to decrease the amount of cytokinins. So again, it's an indirect kind of a mechanism. So what do the cytokinins do? Well, they're chemicals found in the plant which promote bud growth. Therefore, if the auxin is around and it's inhibiting the cytokinins from being made, there'll be no cytokinins, and then it'll be very difficult for lateral buds to grow. So abscisic acid blocks the growth of these lateral buds, and the cytokinins encourage them. However, when they're low, this encouragement will also be low. Plant hormones play an important role in the leaves as well. In colder climates, deciduous plants shed their leaves in the autumn time to try and reduce the transpiration from their leaves and the loss of water in the winter. So deciduous plants end up losing their leaves in the autumn, and they regrow their leaves in the spring. The reason for this is to reduce transpiration, and in the winter it's very easy to lose water from the leaves in transpiration. So because of this, the deciduous plants aim to shed their leaves, and therefore they reduce their loss of water in this process. The molecules that we saw before, called cytokinins, normally try to delay the leaf aging or senescence, because the cytokinins help to maintain the nutrient supply in the leaves. So the cytokinins are a particular type of plant hormone, and in their functions, they help keep nutrient supply of the leaf high. Because if there are no nutrients in the leaf, the leaf will end up dying and therefore age. So in the winter, the cytokinins would start decreasing in their level, and therefore the leaves age, and then they end up falling off. The auxins which are present in the leaves as well, inhibit the leaf abscission, and abscission refers to the falling of the leaves. So inside the leaf, we have various types of auxins as a family of molecules, and these normally inhibit the loss of the leaves by keeping them on and attached to the plants. So what happens in the winter, or the early stages of autumn, is that the cytokinin and auxin levels in the leaves decrease. And because of this, leaf senescence occurs and leaf abscission occurs. So try and think about how these molecules work. The cytokinins promote nutrient supply in the leaf. And we said before that the auxins inhibit the leaves being dropped, so they inhibit aging. So if both of these levels go down in the winter, then the nutrient supply of the leaves will go down, and the inhibition of leaves falling off will stop as well, which means that eventually leaves start falling off, 
and the plant will become aged and the leaves will have all fallen off. As well as this, when there is low water availability, abscisic acid is another hormone and it causes the stomata in the leaves to close up. So if the water availability is very low, it's not being absorbed at the roots so much, and the hormone abscisic acid is released, and this causes the stomata to go from an open stage to a closed phase. And the reason for this is so that less water is lost through the stomata, because the water supply is very low, and therefore it's very valuable. So this further reduces the loss of water through the transpiration stream. So if water is being lost in transpiration from the leaf, and this is okay if the transpiration stream is taking water through the roots, up the stem, and along the xylem. So this is the transpiration stream. So if water availability is very low at the root end, then we can't afford to lose water in the leaves through transpiration. The abscisic acid levels rise and clothe the stomata, so this is reduced and the water is maintained. Another important group of plant hormones are known as gibberellins, and they're important in the process of stem elongation, so making the stem longer. So gibberellins are a family of plant hormones, and they control the stem elongation process, and also seed germination in plants. So stem elongation is referring to the idea that, that the stem can increase in length, and make the plant grow taller, and seed germination refers to the hatching of the seed to grow a stem, and begin growing its roots as well, so that it can start developing into a plant. There's a fungus in Japan which causes a disease which causes rice plants to grow very, very tall. So in Japan, the fungus exists, and essentially when the fungus is around, the rice plants grow very tall. So what this means is their stems elongate very, very far. The reason for this is because the fungus secretes a particular chemical called a gibberellin, and this type of gibberellin is called gibberellic acid. So here's the fungus and it releases the chemical gibberellic acid. The gibberellic acid can be used to make dwarf varieties of plants grow very, very tall. So this suggests that the, the evidence shows that it's responsible for the plant stem growth and elongation. So certain plants are very, very small and we call them dwarf varieties, but when we apply the gibberellins or the gibberellic acid, then it can cause them to grow much taller and elongate the stem. GA1 is a type of gibberellin, and it's directly responsible for causing stem elongation. So again, another type of gibberellins is the GA1 molecule, and this one stimulates the stem to start elongating and makes the plants grow taller. And it's more recently been discovered that the GA1 molecule is formed from the conversion of another type of gibberellin, which is known as GA20. So the GA20 molecule is the original form, and this gets converted in a process to the GA1 molecule. So again, two different types of gibberellins, one is converted into the other. The process was discovered to be catalyzed by a particular enzyme, and the enzyme was encoded by the LE gene, or the LE gene. So we've got the GA20 form being converted to the GA1 form, which then causes stem elongation, and conversions are normally catalyzed by enzymes, and we found that this is coded for by the LE gene. As we said before, gibberellins are also very important in seed germination. So the gibberellin hormones are also released by the plant embryo in seed germination. So remember, in seed germination what happens is, the seed begins growing its own shoots and its own roots. And the idea behind this is so that these can function to start growing the plant and become a fully sized adult plant. And the process of germination can be started off by the release of gibberellins. When the seed starts to absorb water, so if it's been put into an environment which is quite favorable, it causes the embryo to release the gibberellins. So say the seed has managed to reach a particular area of soil with a good water availability, then the water can enter the seed through osmosis, and then the seed will start releasing gibberellins from particular tissues. The gibberellin focuses on seed germination, and so what happens is first the gibberellin enables the production of the enzyme amylase, and the enzyme amylase is focused on breaking down starch into glucose. So the seed has absorbed water, and the seed now is releasing the gibberellin's hormones. The gibberellin's eventually leads to the production of the enzyme amylase, and the seed will have storage of starch molecules inside its tissues before it even germinates. So starch is a polymer of glucose, and in order to start growing, it needs to break the starch down into individual monomers of glucose and that's carried out by the enzyme amylase. 
So now we can yield glucose and the seed can use this in respiration. And as the glucose is used in respiration, the seed embryo can then begin to grow into a fully fledged plant. So glucose goes through all the steps of respiration through the mitochondria. And as energy is released, the seed is allowed to grow and germinate and grow into a fully fledged plant. As well as this, the glucose released from the starch can also be used for protein synthesis. And protein synthesis is very important for growth. So the glucose itself can be converted to amino acids, and the amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And proteins allow growth. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.